Corrie's latest weapon in the ratings war is causing a stir. He's young, attractive and gay. He's sexy male nurse Carl Foster and he's got designs on our Todd. We've been in, but we came out for a couple of minutes, didn't we, Todd? We're on the edge of our seats, but it's not the first time Corrie's been rocked by scandal. <laughs> All the storylines that have happened uh, in Coronation Street over the years would never happen in just in one street, you know, it'd just be outrageous. We take a look at some of those outrageous stories and go behind the scenes to find out how family man Todd Grimshaw has gone from ladies' man to man's man. I remember the producer at the time asked me to take Bruno out um, to lunch to tell him what was going to happen to Todd over the next couple of years. Um, and we went out onto Canal Street for lunch. And I thought, oh... God, you know, what have I done now? Now, Bruno knows that I'd sort of gone through similar stuff in my own life, so um, he sort of trusted me in that. And when I told him that he was going to have to uh, kiss a guy, he got, he was like, OK, OK, and was very, very quiet for about half an hour. And I was kind of shocked at first, because, you know, for a year playing this character, it didn't cross my mind that he would be questioning sexuality. And then he said, actually, this is a really good story, isn't it? This is going to be really, really good. I'm going to have lots of really good scenes to do. It's very dramatic. Yeah, let's do it. This is something I love about Coronation Street and why I'm such a fan, is that when something like this happens, Todd starts questioning his sexuality, you look back and it's been, you know, it's been laid in time since, you know, practically the day he joined. And you can see, you can remember, you know, he was older than Sarah Lou, his girlfriend, but he was a virgin and she wasn't, and she was the one pushing them to have sex and he was a little bit reticent. Sarah thought, oh, that's really sweet. He's, he's waited for the right person. It's to do with love. At the time, you didn't question it at all. You didn't think, oh, it's obviously because he's gay, because he was a sensitive character and it was completely believable. But now, we look back and obviously the signs have been there all along. Who says I don't really fancy her? Well, you've never tried anything. Candice says... Candice? What does she know? Well, d didn't you tell her I don't want to rush you? No, because you'd not said that. I, I thought that you didn't want to. Do you? You? Yeah, of course I do. You don't, do you? I remember he phoned me up and it was Sarah's 16th birthday and in the script, Todd went to bed with her. And he phoned me up and he goes, isn't he gay? I thought he was gay. And I was like, well, no, but um, he's just confused and he wants to do this and he's worried that he can't do it and he gets very excited when he can do it. It was all right then? It was brilliant. Better than the first time? It doesn't count. You were my first time. Hope it's not the last. The best stories, to my mind, are ones which are emotional and uh, sort of dramatic from within a family point of view. So if Todd was ever going to kiss anybody, um, he had to be a member of Sarah's family, and I couldn't see him fancying Martin, and David was far too young. So that left Nick. Sometimes he gets a bit claustrophobic. Pretty soon, you'll get used to it. And when you do, you'll love it. I promise you. Yeah? Todd yeah. was attracted to Nick because Nick's an attractive guy. Um, he'd been travelling, he'd been away, he was kind of free in all the ways that Todd wasn't. So I think Todd looked up to Nick and he felt there, there was a connection. I feel like I could tell you anything. Well, you can. If ever there's anything you wanted to talk about, I wouldn't tell Sarah. I loved the fact that uh, Todd was attracted uh, to uh, uh, Nick, as played by Adam Rickett, because obviously Adam Rickett is, is a gay icon and has graced many uh, the cover of a gay magazine with that uh, six pack uh, that he sports. I don't think the irony was lost on, on many viewers. I mean, there were two very handsome looking boys and two very well manicured looking boys. This thing was built up in the press, you know, Corey's first ever gay kiss, you know, and there was all these people writing in before it being on air saying, you know, it's, it's a disgrace, you know, you're destroying a national, you know, icon of a show. When I did move, I was like, oh, no, he's going to get you, he's going to kiss him. I've never felt this close. The day we filmed it, it, you know, it wasn't particularly my nicest scene ever to do, but there was all these people running around, you all right, you sure you're right, everyone's all right, okay, you sh sh we'll make it, you're all right, you're right, right. And we were just like that, do you know what? It, it's that quick, let's just do it and stop making a deal about it. I've never felt this close. The director came along and he sort of told the crew to take, take five. And uh, we sort of rehearsed it by ourselves, just me, Adam, the director, which is really good, because you need that time just to get your head together. But after doing it nine times, they wanted the kiss quite long, but not too short, so it had to be somewhere in the middle. But uh, Adam kept 
breaking away. Like, as soon as I come near him, he was sort of squirming. So they had to just uh, keep saying, a bit longer, guys, just a, it's a bit longer. <laughs> and it was on screen for about, you know, 1.2 seconds. Never felt this close. What was that? There were a few cheers from sofas around the land and not necessarily, you know, uh, leopard skin print ones or uh, necessarily gay sofas, but I think everybody, because we'd been whipped up uh, by the papers into a bit of a frenzy, uh, appreciated this uh, milestone. Nick is, you know, Todd's girlfriend's brother. It's like, you know, could you not find someone else to fancy? Nick says something like, Wrong move, Todd. Wrong move. And he says it in such a kind of sinister way that I half expected him to, like, send Todd a horse's head in the post the next day as a warning. Nick's reaction, um, certainly uh, from where I was sat, on the edge of the sofa or not, uh, to me was a little bit the lady doth protest too much. I think he kind of feels this overprotective need to almost prove himself to Sarah. So he does, he does go over the top in trying to get Todd to, you know, face up to the truth. I want to spend the rest of my life with her. I even want to have kids with her. In your dreams. No, in reality. Because the matter of fact, we are. She's carrying my baby. So now tell me I'm gay. Sarah's pregnant. Yeah, which is why I don't want you coming round upsetting her. You got my sister pregnant to prove a point. Todd's sudden rush into commitment, back into commitment with Sarah, um, after the whole kiss with Nick, I think, is probably a very natural reaction from someone who has been utterly confused, you know, has had the reaction they weren't expecting from someone, you know, when they went in for the kill, when they went in for that kiss, you know, it's all gone horribly wrong. Um, all Todd wants to do now is get back to normal. He's probably trying to convince himself that he's a real man and that the seed of his loin, once buried in the loin of his woman, would be enough to repress uh, the fact that he would rather be singing Mandy by Barry Manilow. I actually feel sorry for both Todd and Sarah because Sarah hasn't got a clue what's going on in Todd's mind and she's a little baby on the way, she's got Bethany who Todd is wanting to adopt. Um, so I feel sorry for Sarah that way but also Todd because he's so confused. Sarah really has no idea at all. I mean um, Carl's friends with Todd and um, the, we did these scenes not so long ago where uh, Sarah's like, oh, oh is he gay? Oh, he's a really nice guy. Do, doesn't even for one second think Todd kissed Nick. Todd was confused. Now his best mate is gay. You know, she doesn't even seem to, that doesn't come into her head because as far as she is concerned, she trusts him, she loves him, he loves her. Girl Next Door, Sarah Louise Platt, was just 13 when she was plunged into one of the street's most shocking storylines ever. My dad, when I'd auditioned for the part, had said to me, you know, if you get that part, they're going to have you pregnant. I was like, don't be so daft. She still wasn't even wearing makeup, you know, had any highlights or anything. She was, she was just this mousy little thing. And then when she was pregnant, it was just, but what do you mean? How can she be? The producer of the time asked me into her office, uh, which is unusual, and uh, to tell me about the storyline. And when she told me, I thought, well, OK, my daughter's pregnant. That's OK, that'll be a good story. All I could do is go, Wow. I came out, shut the door, and thought, <gasps> Sarah Lou's 13, she's 13, oh my God. This is a story that could have happened 30 years ago, 40 years ago on Coronation Street. Teenage girls have got pregnant for years and years and years. I read an article a few weeks back about a girl who was 11 who had just had twins. I don't think anything like that had been done on the street before a 13-year-old pregnant. That was pretty devastating. Are you happy to talk with your mum present? Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to tell us? No. Will somebody tell us what's going on? The reason why Sarah Louise has put on some weight is because she's pregnant. I remember going in having absolutely no idea how I was going to do this scene. She's 13 years old. She's never had a proper boyfriend. Tell her. Tell her. Tell her there's a mistake. Sarah Lou, look at me. Look at me, please. 
And then I realised I, I couldn't really, it was too enormous, so I, it was best, I just let it go, I just didn't think anything. Tell the doctor, you can't be pregnant if you've never had sex. <laughs> I was supposed to be more shocked and not really speaking much, so I guess I had the easier part. At the same time, I had to blub my eyes out. <laughs> and after that day, I think I blubbed my eyes out for the next, like, six months. Actually, I think it's one of my favourite scenes. The first scenes that I got to do with Helen were... F I loved them. Even to this day, they're the f my most favourite scenes that I've ever done. Audrey reacted to Sarah Louise's pregnancy initially very badly. Oh, I see. You don't know, is that it? So she's been sleeping with all sorts. Oh, at least I knew who Stephen's father was and yours. Well, you never saw fit to tell me. Oh, Gail, that was years ago. We're talking about now. We're talking about Sarah Louise. What is she, the town tart? Oh, ma'am, just get out, will you? Her granny accuses my daughter of being the town tart when she was the town tart for many years before her. No, no, I don't think that's fair at all of Audrey. Now I shall have a word about that. I felt really sorry for Sarah. I thought, oh, you mean grandma. The reason Audrey called Sarah names about this and really gave her a hard time is because she'd been there. I mean, who knows about all this? The oh. whole world, I suppose. Uh -huh. It's the council you're worried about. Well, yes, it is, actually. Because I have dragged myself up to be on that council and now she is dragging me back down again. The biblical saying, sins of the fathers, um, rings true more often than not in Weatherfield, especially when you look at like the House of Barlow or the House of Platt, um, because neither families have set great examples uh, for their children. The Sarah Lee pregnancy story was brilliant in getting, in getting teenagers and parents to talk about teenage pregnancy. We actually had more complaints before the storyline aired than when it actually did air, because it was soon obvious that when the programme came on screen, we weren't advocating teen pregnancy as a great thing. We certainly weren't making it look glamorous. We were, t you know, it was something that was destroying this girl's life and her family's life. One of the best scenes, I thought, in the whole story was when Gail and Martin and Sarah went to the school and saw this 13-year-old little lad kicking a football around in the playground. <laughs> And he was the father. We're a bit early. Oh, Mum, please, can we just go wait inside? I really don't want to wait out here. Oh, will you tell him? Yeah. Oh, no. What's up? Oh, I don't believe it. Well, do you know him? Him! That's him! Martin? What? That's him! It's him what? Him! And in their minds, I think in the viewers' minds, they thought little Sarah had been taken advantage of by his big hulking lad, and it wasn't. It was a little kid playing football. It was anyone's son, anyone's grandson, and that's what I think brought it home to the viewers. I like the way they didn't try and, you know, make it this huge love story between her and, you know, the father, Neil. They didn't try and turn it into something it wasn't, you know, forbidden love and Romeo and Juliet, how romantic. It was, it was literally, you know, a one night, experimenty, teenagey thing that, that ended up with very serious consequences. Indeed, the real Romeo and Juliet of the street are Katie and Martin. Of course, Martin is a little too old to be playing the role of Romeo to Katie's Juliet, 35 years too old. Now that's guaranteed to generate serious heat and get the tongs wagging. People get uncomfortable about age differences, full stop. I don't want to hear it. When Gail started going out with Martin, and there was a 10-year difference. You know, there was all this toy boy this, toy boy that. Um, now Martin starts going out with somebody, you know, 19, 20 years younger than him. Huge, huge uproar. Get your filthy hands off her! Let go of mine, he'll kill you! Get out of way! Come here! When I told um, most of my friends about Katie and Martin getting together, uh, a lot of them were excited because it's a brilliant storyline, but um, a lot of them were like, oh my God! He's gone from the older woman to the younger woman, hasn't he? Natural leap, really. The age gap between Katie and Martin is 19 years, which is huge, and um, a lot of people don't really accept that. Oh! If I was Sarah, I wouldn't. I'd be like, wait a second, as far as I'm concerned, you're my dad. You're going out with someone that's my age. Ooh. You know, I'd just, I'd just be like, oh! 
I think a lot of teenage girls want to go out with an older guy. 19 years, I mean, it's, it's not a patch on Catherine Zeta-Jones and Michael Douglas, but because they are older, both of them, it's less shocking. Yes, but Martin Platt, please, is that really the best you could come up with? He treated her like an adult, which her parents never did. Um, she didn't have many friends and she, they were always there for her. So he helped through all that. Then they did a fun run together. Um, then he stayed there for a bit because he had cockroaches in his flat. So it kind of just grew over a few weeks. And I think, you know, she'd never seen that side of any, well, no one's ever shown her the love that he did. Him. I love take a look at the posters on your wall. There's any amount of boy bands out there you can have a crush on. What on earth do you see in Martin Platt? <laughs> He'd seen a bit of life, his experience, you know, but not, you know, in her eyes, so old that he's ancient. You can't carry on seeing her. You just can't. Oh, I'm not finishing it. <gasps> but you're my dad. Dads don't go jumping into bed with the daughter's friends. I love her. More than you love me and David. Well, I didn't realise I had to choose. Well, I just didn't fancy having her as a wicked stepmother. Oh. Well, I'm sorry, Sarah. Yeah, so am I. Yes, I think Martin should have known better <laughs> to go for a girl at 16, but I don't know. Kate is so persuasive about everything. Um, she's always pushing and she'll always get what she wants. Uh, so, anyway, I couldn't say no. Look, if you trust me, then what is the problem? Look, I didn't want this. That's why I tried to get out of it. OK? You didn't try very hard, though, did you? Forget it. All right. <clears throat> It would be all too easy to argue that uh, Martin should have known better. And to be fair, he did wrestle with his conscience for a good fortnight or so before he started wrestling with his buckle. Katie just wasn't having any of it. She was like, I want you and I'm having you. And that was it. <laughs> I think Tommy went over the top when he found out about Katie and Martin. <laughs> Tommy's reaction was typical of Tommy, thinking with his fists. I saved your daughter's life. I jumped into a canal and saved her life. And what did you do in return, eh? How did you pay me? I just think he's an absolute meathead. He's a brute. If he don't deserve a slap, I don't know, does he? If he was my dad, I would just... I think I'd have to do that American thing and divorce my parents. He's a nightmare. Martin was one of Tommy's best friends. Going out with a 16-year-old daughter, the big age gap, the fact that, you know, he's just so close to both of them. Um, especially Katie, who's bound to react like that. Let me get my hands on your 16-year-old daughter. Let me take her to bed. Let me get her a right good scene to her. Then you'll know how I'm feeling. It wasn't like that. I think Katie and Martin's relationship was doomed from the start. Um, however long it goes on for, it will be doomed. Even if they, you know, got married and stayed together for five years and had kids, it will be doomed because at, uh, at one point, in one point, she is going to be a, more attracted to somebody her age, he might be more attracted to somebody his age, and part of the attraction of the story is that it was doomed, because you as a viewer are waiting to see what goes wrong. Viewing figures went through the roof in 1998, when the street courted more controversy and made soap history at the same time, introducing a transsexual character. Haley, formerly Harold Patterson, caught us all unawares. For a while, the press sort of, you know, got it a bit upside down and thought we were introducing a transvestite. There's been all this hoo-ha about Corrie having a, a gay kiss and a gay character when there's been a transsexual character in it for years. It's always good when you put characters together in Coronation Street if one or both of them have a secret. I don't know what it is, Roy, but I feel as though I can trust you completely. Even with, well, even with my most intimate secrets. What's the biggest secret you could give a woman? Well, the biggest secret is that she's not actually a woman. She's a, a pre-op transsexual. I don't think it had ever been heard of, a sex change, and I thought, wow, that's something. It was quite hard to explain to my son that, well, you know, in certain instances, every time there's a new character, they like to have a go at the fact that Hayley was once Harold, and, you know, every character seems to have a go at her. All right, Harold. Would, would you just go away? You fooled me. I'll give you that. Mind, 
I've never looked at you that close. <laughs> I've never wanted to. I was really happy that the character had a controversial edge. Uh, my main concern was that Coronation Street handled it sensitively. You know, there's, there's a big, strong comic element to Coronation Street, which I'd hate ever to be eradicated, but I very, very much wanted them to, to deal with it in a sensitive way because I knew that people were really living with it and uh, you have to respond to that properly. I do actually remember thinking at the time that um, that could have been a right mess, you know. And, and I think because of Julie's strength, um, she, I think she made it, made it work. I was left out all the time. I couldn't join the group. People have different interests. Men don't have to be sporty. They don't I have hated to... hated my body, Roy. When it started to grow, it, it felt like sores breaking out. I, I don't... I oh, don't please no. let me tell you. Look, you, you look like a woman. No. All I wanted was for us to you have a meal together. imagine the loneliness. My dad wouldn't let me wear these clothes. The only place I was allowed to be my real self was in my room, so I just stayed there. If you've got a woman's body, you're a woman. If you've got a man's body, you're a man. You have to be a man in your head. And I wasn't. The issue for me was of any sort of prejudice and, and, and how this guy deals with it. <laughs> Hello, Roy. <laughs> don't go. <laughs> Listen. <clears throat> I don't want to be having this conversation. Well, we'll have to have it sometime. We're supposed to be friends. Please, Hayley, or whatever your name is, leave me alone. What it did for my character was, well, what does that make me? If I'm attracted to this person and I'm straight, and because he can't think of any other way, what does that make him? Is that, and that's, again, as I say, it's what the, how the, the way the character perceives himself and what is actually happening, and that gap in between is where you have the fun, where the drama is. I don't like talking about things I don't understand. So I know what I'm used to. It's enough that you like me. That's all I'm asking. We got a lot of criticism um, at the time for casting a woman, but I think if we'd have cast a man, we would have lost that character by now, because there's no way you'd have spent five, six years dragging up you know, every weak to play the character and Kaylee wouldn't be on our screens anymore and that would be a huge shame. The Street is now aired five times a week so the pressure is on to keep those storylines rolling. In 2001, it risked upsetting Asian viewers when Sunita Parekh arrived on the scene, escaping from an arranged marriage. Rachel turns up in Friends in the first episode in a wedding dress, and no one bats an eyelid. You know, Sunita turns up and running away from an arranged marriage, and suddenly it's, oh, you know, they're going down that road. It was much bigger pre the storyline actually playing out. People, you know, particularly some Asian communities and Asian media actually did you know were fearful that we were actually going down a, a stereotypical route you know we'd gone from bringing an asian character in that ran a corner shop to bringing an asian character in who was fleeing an arranged marriage and how much more stereotypical could we get i don't mean to be rude but unless somebody tells me what's going on i'm going straight out that door this sunday i'm booked on a flight to india i'm supposed to be getting married there only i've changed my mind but my mum says i can't and i've got to go I don't want to. So we've had this huge fight and now I'm hiding from my own family. When I heard that Sunita was coming in uh, on an arranged marriage story, I have to say, I, I laughed and I cried <laughs> at the same time. What do I know about living in India? It's not my home. I've got a few cousins over there, but I'm a northern girl. I like fish and chips, Ryan Giggs. <laughs> and there's you telling me she was weird. <laughs> I was quite keen to go with it because at the same time as it being a stereotype for me, for, for, for many other people, it, it might not have even occurred to them that people go through marriages like that. Though I was insistent that I wouldn't portray her as a victim. I just want somebody who's tall, dark and handsome. Yeah, you'll have a job to find a guy like that in Weatherfield. Yeah, you'll have to lower your standards a bit, love. <laughs> no way! Andy has to be successful. I'm, I'm not marrying no layabout. And I like a man who's romantic, you know. Brings me flowers and that. 
Hey, watch out, Gina. Sounds like death to me. <laughs> <laughs> because we saw Sunita as just a normal girl, a normal girl, you know, who'd grown up in Manchester, had a very normal lifestyle, just happened to be Asian as well. Um, we just kind of sympathised with her plight. It didn't all become massively issue-led. The thing is, right, this is not the first time I've let them down. Ask me, Mum. At school, at work, I've failed exams, I've had the wrong sort of boyfriends. Every time she wanted to be proud of me, I've ended up making her miserable. Well, why do you think I agreed to this marriage in the first place? Oh, come on, come on, it's all right. It's all right. I worked very closely with um, Jimmy Herkishan, who plays Dev. And between us, and I suppose because he'd been there longer than I had, and, you know, I was a complete novice, we kind of looked at it and we kind of found ways of playing it that would then reflect a certain truth. It is still very relevant in the 21st century today because it's happening. Um, and certainly, I, I, families do disown uh, daughters, which is clearly what happened in Sunita's case. It's the biggest soap opera on television, so it was, you know, it was very brave of them to take that, very, uh, an issue that's very sticky. Do you agree to marry Deepak Parmar? No. Then you leave us no choice, Sunita. You are no longer a member of this family. She's shown herself up really now as to be quite fickle, aren't Sunita? <laughs> she thinks she wants to get married, but I don't think she really does in the end. Peter Barlow, on the other hand, just loves getting married. Last year he had us in the palm of his hand as he wed first Lucy, then Shelley, and became Britain's most famous bigamist. With this story, we actually did know from the outset that we wanted to try and tell the story of a man who, without ever intending to, ended up married to two women at the same time. There was certainly something, a quality about the character as it was played, that, that made you think, oh, well, I can understand. I mean, he's torn between two lovers, you know, behaving like a fool. I mean, we've all been there, haven't we? See, Shelley likes Peter because she thinks she can change him. Like, she, she makes the mistake that all women do, that, the, you know, Peter Bell is exactly what he says on the box. He's always messed her about. He's always been a little bit, you know, not quite there, somewhere else. Where am I? Well, I'm in the... Uh, I'm in the bowling alley, love. Where else? Peter, you cad. And the same for you, Lucy. Yeah, it is. It's, it's quiet because I'm in the gents. We always saw Lucy as being that much... Um, more in control and uh, a little more calculating and, if you like, smarter. You going home? Yeah. I think I should, don't you? You'll miss the full tour. Look, Lucy. What intrigued me about it was that Peter had gone for two blonde women. <laughs> I know it sounds really inane, but that's why I was quite intrigued by the by the similarity of the two girls. You forget sometimes, hang on, you've got so many scenes, you're thinking, I've just, hang on, sorry, no, it's not Lucy, it's Shelley. Is it Shelley? Who am I, have I, no, you're married to them both. Oh, right. OK, so is it Shelley or Lucy in this next scene? Absolutely brilliantly written, and we were all strung along week in, week out. And just when you thought they were about to reach their zenith, their apotheosis, we would be reeled back in, and it would spin off on another tangent. It's you that I love. Peter, don't say that. You're lying to me, and it hurts. I'm not. I'm speaking the truth. I love you more than anyone. Marry me. Hold on a minute. He's already engaged. He can't... He can't do this. It's that male thing, isn't it? Uh, certainly as far as the Barlows are con concerned of wanting to further the line. Although clearly I think the whole family should be neutered from birth. But it's that, you know, th th that need, that desire to see the family name uh, continue. He just didn't want to upset either of his girlfriends. Now whether he should have had two girlfriends in the first place could be cause for discussion. I think Peter did what a lot of men do. do. He just coasted along hoping somehow or other things were going to sort themselves out. And of course they didn't. Ah! Whoa! Whoa, 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 whoa. Ah! For all that you're going away prison. How could Shelley not have known? How stupid is she? That question kept coming up. It was utterly, utterly believable especially with those panda eyes of him. You'd believe anything that man said to you. And Shelley so desperately loved him and so desperately wanted to believe that this was the man for her. The truth is that love is blind. Eyes wide open but never saw a thing. Oh.
As we watched Peter breaking Shelley's heart, his stepsister became embroiled in another Corrie controversy, the storyline Date Rape. I heard about the storyline before, long before I read about it. Um, David Nielsen, who plays Roy, told me, and I didn't believe him. I just thought it seemed so off the scale. Because at that point, Roy and Hayley hadn't had any dealings at all with Tracy. So suddenly to be told that she would be carrying Roy's baby and, and all this would come of it, I, I just couldn't make the leap. I was called into Kieran, uh, Kieran Roberts' office and he told me the storyline and I was just like that. I just remember walking um, into town with David Nielsen and he said to me, I'm really sorry. <laughs> so we're sorry for. He said, well, you're just going to get so much hassle this summer. People didn't like the idea of, I think, any kind of sort of sexuality being introduced into, you know, sort of Roy's storyline. It just didn't sit comfortably with people. And, of course, the whole thing about, you know, hit and all and, you know, the, the very serious stuff that's going on with that. People just thought, no, this is, A, stretching it just a bit too far in terms of what's believable and also might be trivialising, you know, a very important issue. I don't know what that kind of says, of not just of my good self, but of society today. The fact that it was Tracy duping Roy, um, for some reason, seemed more palatable, although clearly it isn't, but seem more palatable than if it had been the other way round. If you reversed a situation and this was seen happening to a female character, you could not have done it. You could not have handled it the same way. Do you mind if I leave my black pudding? No, of course not. Just don't tell Fred any. He's very proud of his black pudding. <laughs> Actually, I got this from the supermarket. Definitely don't tell him then. Oh, no, you're never at the end of it. Right, Marty. Do you know, yesterday went really well. Well, without a hitch, actually. Roy. Good morning. Morning. Morning, Roy. Hi. Hello. I'm sorry to interrupt your breakfast. Oh, no, it's OK. Cup of tea? The problems um, that the press and some of the critics had with this date rape storyline uh, was that they basically saw it as trivialising an issue. I think the juxtaposition of the fact that, the, the, that there was a comedic element to the storyline as well as the fact that it was, you know, the actual, when, when you sit down and strip it bare, the actual concept of uh, Tracy drugging Roy, who we love anyway as a character, but that aside, drugging anybody, um, you know, in, in order to, to get them uh, into bed. The juxtaposition of them both uh, worked well clearly because it's conflict and that's what drama's based on. Sorry about this. No, no, it's OK. Had a couple of drinks last night, or, I don't know, a bit, bit hazy. Oh, there they are. <laughs> So, uh, is Tracy upstairs? Uh, I, th I think she is, yes. You think she is? Were you really going to sneak off without saying goodbye, you naughty boy? I'm so sorry, I di didn't want to disturb you. And I thought you were a gentleman, Roy Cropper. I'm sorry, I've got to go. Go go goodbye. You knew as the viewer, knowing the character and common sense, which is that she, you know, she drugged him and it would have been very unlikely that he would have been able to, you know, be unfaithful to Hayley. Deirdre Barlow as well and Ken Barlow, they've not been nearly um, disciplined enough with Tracy over that. All has been forgiven far too quickly as far as I'm concerned. Tracy would still be on my knee and not in a good way. Are you, are you coming to bed with me? Of course I am. When it was on screen, Overwhelmingly, people have said, I didn't like this storyline, I didn't like it, but now I'm really loving it and really enjoying it. I think in one magazine it said something like, we apologise for saying it was ridiculous because as it's unfolded, it's not been quite like as what it seemed at first. <laughs> she didn't actually sleep with Roy Cropper. You know, she just did it to, because she was so unhappy and she did it to prove to herself and to, and to Bev that she could get Roy into bed. But it wasn't that. It's a story of, it's a story of unhappiness, really, and dysfunctional relationships and jealousy, and it's not really what it seemed at first. Coronation Street itself became embroiled in controversy when it portrayed the rape of Toya Battersby in 2001. The Toya rape is an interesting one because I think we possibly pushed the boundaries there a little more than we maybe have done before or, or even since, really. We'd had women being attacked before in Coronation Street. There was, uh, Bet was once attacked in the back alley and left for dead. Deirdre was molested under a viaduct. Um, but when it came to the rape of Toya, it was much more gritty and graphic. 
，超越。It was the whole hog, wasn't it? And pretty terrifying. If you're going to look at something like rape, you can't really water it down. I'd been in the show for three years at that time, so I'd kind of done my training. And I kind of thought, oh, yeah, this is my, my chance now. And then I kind of panicked and thought, hang on a minute, Corrie hasn't done this before. So I knew that it was going to get a lot of media attention and I knew that people were going to be kind of waiting with bated breath and waiting to criticise it. For me personally as an actress, that was something to get your teeth into that was a bit beyond the kind of, can I have a hot pot, Betty, please? Or Les, you've been in my purse again. Janice, of course, you all too easily see as you know this two-headed beast who's either black or white. Um, to see her you know, to see the mother-daughter relationship in the context of that um, w was terrific. And it was, you know, it was Weatherfield women at their best. Listen to me, right? You have got to remember everything that happened to you, right? Everything. Do you understand me? I can't. Yes, you can. You've got to. Because that's how they're going to get him. That's how they'll catch him. We're going to call the police. <gasps> And you've got to tell them everything. And they'll catch him, I promise. Me and uh, Georgia went to like a rape centre and, uh, you know, we talked to counsellors there and it was, you know, it was quite harrowing. It sounds funny, but it was quite an emotional experience. I did kind of, you know, they asked me if I had any questions and I was kind of a bit, I felt a bit uptight and didn't really know what to say. And then I did go home and have a cry. And it was hard, you know, but afterwards we felt like we'd actually earned our wages. Because we didn't have any rehearsal, I didn't know what was going to come out of my mouth. Well, obviously I knew the lines, but I didn't know how I was going to play it until I got in there and did it. There was a certain kind of rawness about it. It was like she'd been raped. It was so, you know, dramatic in the way she was and the way she was shaking and screaming and, you know, that, that scene played itself, really. It's all right. <laughs> I'm not leaving you like this. One of the directors who was doing some of that stuff told me that the blood looked too realistic. It looked so wet that it looked like it was dripping, like it was fresh, and that he thought it was a little bit too much for pre-watershed. So in the edit, they had to use some kind of graphic, technical thing to kind of take the shine off it. It's going to be all right. It'll be all right because I'm not going to let this happen to you. Toya, please, think for me. Think. Who did this to you? Oh. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. I've got you. Oh, my beautiful little girl. I got an amazing reaction from the viewers. A lot of mothers and daughters would come up to me together and say, oh, you know, we, we sat and watched it together and we were crying and... I suppose they could kind of identify with the, with the Janice Toy relationship. I don't think there's any reason why Coronation Street shouldn't look as a rape as a storyline. The programme is about things that happen to people, and sadly, rape is something that does happen to people. I think it's all about how you tackle it. And I think aside from maybe the gruesome scenes in the alleyway, I think we should only really be praised for the way that we actually then followed everything that Toya was going through from there on in. Um, and, you know, Georgia Taylor did win awards, and quite rightly, for what she did. Over the years, we've seen it all. Teenage mums, bigamy, date rape and sex changes. But what we really wanted was two men French kissing. We've been waiting more than 40 years, so the team had to get it right. I created Carl very specifically. I had a very very clear image of what he was in my head and as soon as Chris Finch walked through the door I, I remember saying to the producer that is Carl. Found out I'm gay have you? I was going to uh, acting classes at the time and uh, my acting tutor recommended that I, I write into Granada to the casting directors because he thought I'd be a perfect casting for it. Uh, I sounded right, I, I looked right um, so I, I sent my details in and then the next day my agent phoned me up and said um, Coronation Street want to see you for the part. I was over the moon because I'd heard about the breakdown of, of this character and who he was and I thought it's just that's, that's perfect for me to play. He looked exactly right. 
And it was very weird. I'd done a biog, um, an A4 sheet on paper, saying exactly what he was like. And the first line was, he's, he's 24 and he comes from Bolton. I remember Chris going, I'm 24 and I come from Bolton. When uh, myself and Bruno were, uh, were doing the screen test, um, I think uh, I could tell instantly that, um, that he was an easy person to get on with. Um, he had a good sense of humour. So and we just laugh. the things that we were talking about, so we were having a laugh this, and the chemistry uh, was there right away. I really like you. I mean, I really, really like you. I don't want to hurt anyone. You're hurting yourself. All you do, all you ever seem to do is try to please people. You've got to start thinking of what you want, what you really want. I know what I want. I want you. Do you? Yeah. Then let's be together. All the time. No more secrets, no more hiding away. If you really love me, then you'll tell Sarah. And whatever she says, whatever she does, I'll be here for you. Will you? I'm not going anywhere. I actually did the first scene on Friday with Chris and Bruno. And I was stuck back and just thinking, actually, you know, they make a really good couple when they were working together. Same for me. You also have a possessive boyfriend. Possessive girlfriend. I wouldn't know about them. She has to let me out, because I have to earn money. What if you want for that? She want me there in that flat, every minute of every day. Perhaps we should introduce her to Robbie. Yeah. We could obsess about each other, which would leave us free to do what we like, without being nagged at until where we have to be or what we have to do. Remind me, you are planning on marrying this girl. Yeah. Todd put all these responsibilities on himself, um, but he can't help liking the fact that, that Carl can go for a drink whenever he wants. He can go out with his mates, and Todd really warms to that. Carl is very, very confident with his sexuality and very confident with who he is. He's not got a problem with it. He's grown up with it, came out at 17, he's fought his battles, he knows who he is. Todd really admires that in him and thinks, I want to be like that, I, I like that in him. Clearly shares the same hairdresser as Nikki Tilsley. Has quite a swagger in that nurse's uniform. Hey. Todd. Todd, wait, will you? He sees a flicker in Todd, a flicker of, of homosexuality. And as soon as he sees that, he thinks, well, I've got a chance here. So he wants Todd, he, want, he wants to, to turn Todd. And also he fancies the pants off him too. <laughs> Initially, um, the producer wanted the kiss between Todd and Carl um, to be on one of our sets. I felt very strongly it had to be on Canal Street because it means more to Todd. If we see Todd taking his, his first steps into a, a gay area um, surrounded by gay couples or, or, or good looking guys on their own and you take him into that and, and, you, and you throw him into the middle of that, into a bar and, and that sort of atmosphere, he's going to feel nervous, he's going to feel excited, he's going to feel scared. And if you have the kiss at that point, it means a hundred times more than if you have it sort of in a back alley somewhere. Sean says you're always rowing and making up. In the past, yeah, when we've been together, but we're not together anymore. I dumped him. It's over. Todd, I came out with you tonight. Don't let Robbie spoil that. Why did you invite me here? Because I wanted to be with you. Why did you come? <laughs> As Carl drags. Um, Todd's sexuality out of him, I think um, he'll also bring him out of himself and ultimately Todd will become more comfortable and, uh, and be a bit more up for a good time. The great thing about this story also is that we're setting ourselves up for, for lots of other stories to follow. Um, you know, Sarah is pregnant, they are planning to get married, um, you know, uh, you know, Todd's got these, these feelings. Um, what's his mother going to say? What's his brother going to say? What's Gail going to say if it all comes out? You know, Carl works with Martin, is that going to be a secret? Is someone else going to find out? There's all these ticking time bombs just waiting to explode. That's what makes it a good story. Eileen's never been keen on Todd and Sarah getting together. So I guess, I guess she'll be shocked, but at the same time, she'll be relieved that he's not going to be with Sarah anymore. Doesn't have the uh, responsibility of a baby. I think there's definitely going to be fireworks when Sarah finds out the truth. I mean, at the moment she's pregnant and her hormones are already all over the place. And Todd has asked her to marry him 
and it's him that's you know that sort of said all this let's get married let's do this and now he's the one backing out so when that happens I think there's going to be a lot of things said. It would be nice to see Todd and Carl um, get together, live together comfortably with each other on the street and for them to be um, to be accepted um, and live in harmony really with everybody else. However, we are talking about soap opera and happy endings are a rarity. So, what are you doing? You staying out? I'm going back in. We'll have to wait and see.